Uh, good evening and welcome everyone, both those of you here with us uh, at Alabash Recital Hall and those of you watching from home. My name is Krithika Vargor and I'm a journalist, speechwriter, and editor at The Drift Magazine and a current fellow at the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the CUNY Graduate Center. This unique and special institution founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007 has supported dozens of biographies to date, taking on subjects from Lorne Michaels to Gertrude Stein, and in my case, the Princesses Dalip Singh, three Anglo-Indian sisters who lived in Victorian England. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Shelby White for her steadfast support, helping countless biographers in their task of what James Atlas once called adding to the stock of available reality. I'd also like to thank the Graduate Center's public programs who are co-sponsoring tonight's event. We have an amazing fall docket here at the Graduate Center, and I'll briefly flag our next event on Wednesday, November 16th, where British historian Jeffrey Wheatcroft will discuss his groundbreaking single volume biography of Winston Churchill with the British American journalist Simon Winchester. You can register for this free event on the Graduate Center's website. And now it's my privilege to introduce the women of the hour. We're here tonight to celebrate Margot Jefferson's dazzling new memoir, Constructing a Nervous System. Ms. Jefferson is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and academic and one of the foremost critics working in America today. She started her career as a staff book and arts critic for the New York Times and has written widely for outlets, including but not at all limited to the Washington Post, New York, Vogue, Book Forum, and The Nation. Her first book, A Reflection on Michael Jackson, was published in 2006, and her second book, published in 2005, was Negroland, a memoir of her singular upbringing in the black bourgeoisie of mid-century Chicago. Negroland was a national bestseller and received the 2016 National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, as well as the Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize and the Bridge International Prize. The New York Times Book Review compared her to America's greatest thinkers on race, including James Baldwin, Frederick Douglass, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Ms. Jefferson's essays have been widely anthologized. She has appeared in Ken Burns' documentary Jazz, American Masters on PBS, and many more. Earlier this year, she received the 2022 Wyndham Campbell Prize for Nonfiction, on which occasion the organization said her incisive commentary on American life opens up counterintuitive dimensions and invites us to rethink our assumptions on nodding complex ethical subjects. She lives here in New York and teaches writing at Columbia University. Constructing a Nervous System, her latest book, is in some ways a continuation of the project of Negroland, but also pushes in thrilling new directions. Though it's subtitled a memoir, she jumps seamlessly between the various chapters of her own life and the artists who have held her critical attention throughout it, from Ella Fitzgerald to Beyonce, from Willa Cather to Othello. Song lyrics, ekphrasis, critique, memory, these are all one art for Margot Jefferson. And there's no chance none of us will have read, watched, or listened as much as the author, but simply to be along for the ride in her book is a thrill. This book will be on sale in the lobby after this event, um, where Margot Jefferson has kindly agreed to sign copies. You can also get it online from bookshops.org. Um, Ms. Jefferson will be in conversation tonight with another brilliant writer and fellow memoirist, Elizabeth Kendall who's a historian and critic of dance, film, and performance, and a literary studies professor at the New School's Lang College and the New School for Social Research. She was a Leon Levy Fellow here while working on her 2013 book, Balanchine and the Lost Muse. And she has written two other nonfiction books, two memoirs, and countless articles about dance, fashion, and film. She's received other fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Coleman Center, the Rockefeller Foundation, and more. And she is currently working on another George Balanchine book about his early years in the US. Um, Elizabeth Kendall will now lead a discussion for about 45 minutes, and then we'll take questions at the end at the microphones on the left and right. Um, so without further ado, let's give a very warm welcome to Margot Jefferson and Elizabeth Kendall. These are on. These are on. OK. Um, hi, audience. Good evening. Hello. Yes. <laughs> They're on. Uh, first of all, special thanks to Krithika Varagur. Yes. 
for stepping in on short notice as moderator, as introducer, as general host. It's an honor to be in the company of such an amazingly accomplished investigative journalist. And it is an honor for me to be Margot's interlocutor tonight for two main reasons and many others. First, because we are different from the usual colleagues having a learned conversation. We are also close friends. We are what you might call, leaving behind girlish, girlish associations of the term, best friends. And we have been that since the early 1980s. I had the honor and the extremely entertaining uh, experience of watching this book come together. Literally, I saw it go from a bunch of pieces to a whole coherent book, <laughs> occupying a kind of sui generis place inside the category of biography or even of autobiography. Uh, the second reason why it's an honor is because we get to be part of this center's conversations about the art and craft. This is a quote from the Center of Self-Presentation, the art and craft of biography historically and in our time. So, Margo doesn't know what I'm gonna ask her. I don't. <laughs> um, and I hope I can surprise her a little. Um, so what is this book really? Is it a kind of autobiography, autofiction, auto nonfiction? What do you call it? Um, all right, it is certainly, I'll throw in two terms that I use actually in the book and then I'll get back to yours. Um, temperamental autobiography, um, it's also cultural autobiography. Uh, and I guess what, now I will do auto nonfiction, I don't think it's auto-fiction because though there are little details that are made up, we, this is not what one wants to give out to the world. Um, and the main, when I make things up, um, they are clearly, I'm saying this is a fantasia, you know, or if it were to happen, I would want it to happen this way. So I would say auto-nonfiction, given that auto these days simply, you know, means a kind of um, conscious, deliberate, um, talking about the process and writing about the process and examining um, the relationship between your writing consciousness and, um, and, the, and, the, and the texts. Um, is it, what was the other question you asked me? Is it, is it biography? Um, it's biography and autobiography because it's filled with little. Um, it's filled with it, little biographies. That, that take are, various stances, points of view. Some of them are like theatrical dialogue. Uh, others are, you know, more what I'd call dramatic historical Some narrative. Some are fake monologues. Some are, did you say fake monologues? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, like Bing Crosby. Like Bing yes, Crosby, that's right. yeah. That's right. Some are um, letters to the person in question. Yes, absolutely. And some are stitched together from quotes that I am very frank about. Um, stealing from other people, um, and those quotes are in conversation with my own um, pieces of narrative. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you about quotes um, in your life in a minute. <laughs> um, but um, yes, I want to say that it's a, a kind of multi genre wildly multi genre book, um, because it begins as a performance, or a, a performance in a dream, literally on a stage with stage directions. Um, at other points, there are these author's conversations with herself, these, the author addressing the reader all the time. It's very generous that way. Uh, the author... It's very intrusive that way, too, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> well, I think readers sort of like that, because it, you know, you're closer to the, to the writer. But... Um, I think that even more fruitful than naming this book's precise place in the vast field of biography and autobiography is focusing on its progression. Um, when you were pulling it all together, you were calling the through line the book's spine. Ah. And our, um, what is the spine and is progression and spine the same thing in this book? I don't remember calling it the spine, really? but, uh, no, I you don't. You were in search of the spine for quite some time. <laughs> that must be why I blocked it out. Um, <laughs> but seriously, the, um, I was in search of that yeah. spine, like, 
sitting up very straight and holding uh, yeah. parts of the body together. We, we vowed to do this. I worked, I worked so much with um, patches, with uh, associations here, with a story there, with a, because it was partly a, a new form. I'd, I'd done criticism all my life. Um, with Negroland, I moved into um, broader, wider narratives and more into um, the intimacies of memoir, but I wanted to go still further with, with this. Um, so I kept, I, I would get up in the morning and I would say, okay, what, what can I write today? And I'd look over what I'd done so far and it might take me straight ahead or I might, it might just veer into another place. I was so terrified of stopping, of not being able to go forward because I was making it up as I went along. What I knew, um, was, you know, I kept saying criticism and memoir, criticism and memoir. I knew that I wanted the critical parts, and I, by that I just mean loosely, the parts where I'm writing about a Josephine Baker or a Willa Cather or um, a Bud Powell um, or an Ella Fitzgerald. Um, I wanted those, my ex render my experiences with them in a way as intimate as the way one talks about one's experiences with um, family, with your mother, with your father, with, you know, with my sister, with a lover. Um, so I, that was crucial. So I kept having to find tones um, and range for that. But I also um, wanted the memoir parts to have a certain, ah, I'm sorry to use the word sternness, but almost a kind of severity where the part of me that was a critic was not resisting um, looking at this creature called Margot Jefferson in her life and um, offering um, some fond judgments, but <laughs> also some severe ones, and being analytic about, um, about the life and the self and even the intimates, the most intimate feelings. The way when you're a critic, there is some part of you that even if you're enraptured, you know, is obliged to be analytic. You, you, yeah. The work obliges it. Your audience, you know, demands it. So I wanted those, those sh that shifting of roles, if you will. Yeah, creative skepticism, maybe. Yes, yes, yes. But yes, exactly. Um, but I wanted that slight switching of roles between what criticism tends to do um, and what memoir tends to do. I wanted the intimacies. Um, and the judgments and the questions to, to keep changing places. Um, audience, I have to reveal, I think this is a wondrous book and not like any other. Um, and I think she does do, you do do what you just said. Um, but I also <laughs> want to flag uh, the progression okay. because it proceeds from a really interesting point that I haven't seen a lot emphasized in any work that's like this, which is the important moment um, at the beginning of the book when the last parent dies and one is therefore left an adult orphan. And this is an important theme in, uh, of the book. Yeah. Audience, if you've had both parents die, you realize suddenly here I am and nobody's looking at me and I could be anybody, but who am I really? Yeah, exactly. Um, when, um, when my mother was in her 70s, we were once talking about the death of her mother um, in Chicago, and she said, that's when I realized I was an orphan. And I thought, you had two daughters, you had me and Denise, you were married, but the intensity when your parents are gone of feeling orphaned, um, which is a plunge backward um, and downward. And a reassessing. Very and much so. You were alone on the stage. Um, yeah. And, and you're peopling it, you know, with the grown-ups in your life and the other children. But, you know, the, the mise-en-scene, the cast of major characters has changed. They're gone. Yeah. And there are new major characters, and they're all you. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're a writer, they are, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, there's this wonderful quote. Um, the book is full of quotes. Um, the wonderful quote is um, Catherine um, uh, Mansfield. Mansfield's quote about multiples. Oh, wait, let me see if I can find that. Um, having which of one's many, many selves? And if I can't, yes, okay. True to oneself, which self? Which of my many? Well, really, what it looks like is coming to hundreds of selves. 
For what with complexes and repressions and reactions and vibrations and reflections, there are moments when I feel I am nothing but the small clerk of some hotel without a proprietor who has all his work cut out to enter the names and hand the keys to the willful guest. And I thought, well, that's going to help me. Right. So you're assembling a new self out of shards of the old, and you're handing the keys to all these other people that are you, or and that are, are in conversation you. with various other people whom you might not have been in conversation with in the same way when you were a child. Right. So this is the point from which the book proceeds. Uh, which I hadn't fully realized. I had not realized until those that kind of excruciating scene with my mother came out, how much this had to do with being an orphan. That was something of a, obvious to you and any reader, but something of a revelation to me. <laughs> so the whole book is, um, is uh, you know, where am I and who am I and who, who am I speaking to um, and who am I speaking with? And um, it, something is requiring a very, a, a conflation of various elements, circumstances in my life require that I ask, that I construct um, alternate, I construct a nervous system, I construct alternate versions of myself. I allow for, investigate certain possibilities, performances um, uh, that weren't, that I didn't have to do before. Um, there is that sense when you're alone in the world after everyone died that you, you are stale in some way, that you may have grown stale. And so right, parts so, of you die with them, and so there you are. Yeah, so it's a sort of a uh, assemblage in a new way. Yes, putting right. It's like you're smashing the bits and putting them together. Yeah, but yes, you can't pretend there are going to be lots of new bits, but you can definitely <laughs> reassemble. Well, there are, there are some new old bits in this book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you write of the pleasures the feminine has given me, and yet a lot of this book concerns male performers male performers as alter egos. That is, in this book, there are no limits to that new assembla assemblage of self. No limits um, in terms of gender boundaries, no limits in terms of race boundaries. Um, and there follows in this book this procession of different kinds of alter egos, but there's a kind of drift in the book from male alter egos Two female alter egos. Yes. Starting yes. with Bud Powell to Ella Fitzgerald. Yes, absolutely. Um, Though in Negroland, I was, you know, much more insistently, almost shamelessly, this is about women. Microphone. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. Um, this, <laughs> Negroland was so very much about, um, about women and, and the, yeah. Women, black women's history, but just women, writers, artists, my, the shaping um, of this trio um, uh, with a lovely father, but one who was in the office um, much of the time, this trio of my older sister, my mother, and me, and all our girl and women friends. Right, so um, I remember when you began this book, you just knew there were going to be these men in it. Um, and um, actually, all the all all the alter egos are artists, uh, are, are entertainers, or a combination of exactly, the above. Exactly, exactly. It's not just anybody. No, um, no, no, no. And no. then we have the extreme. My ambitions were huge when it came to alter egos. And, well, and rightly so. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> then we have the extremely funny trope of the minstrel. Um, if you haven't read this book, there are parts of it that are very funny. Um, Bing Crosby, um, is something more than one of Margot's alter egos. He's her minstrel. Um, Margot, could you he's comment? My white, he's my white minstrel, yes. Um, maybe I should read that part. Actually, um, because it's clearer than I'm going to explain it. All right, read. Um, Just the definition. Oh. oh wait, no, you, tell me. you tell me what to read, Elizabeth. Uh, I promise, yes. Um, you tell me which to which Well, um, I have a couple quotes here, but I okay. want you to read on page 62 a sort of mock monologue of Bing Crosby. Um, yes. I mean, well, it's... I'm Bing, yes, all right. Um, I'm Bing Crosby, 
America first sees me as a Paul Whiteman rhythm boy frolicking in the fields of jazz, shooting the breeze with Bix and Louie, learning from them, slipping, sliding, plunging into the musical phrasings of black jazz, slipping out again to become Crosby the crooner, luring love songs into my vocal chambers, plying them with baritone liquids and tenor trill jewels, De Bingala, the one and only. In me, the lustrous and the fatuous walk hand in hand. <laughs> I am a smooth and honeyed purveyor of ballads. They could have been penned in the parlors of eminent Victorians. Youth fades, business opportunities arise, as, I, as do cultural responsibilities. I embody the pristine, priest-clad dreams of the nation. I give my people going my way and the bells of St. Mary's. I am a multimillionaire with shares in the Santa Anita racetrack. Eventually, I launch my own. Eventually, I have 75 golf club memberships. <laughs> the tar brush sound of my youth is a trick now, a wink-wink titillation for festive occasions. Watch me at Newport in high society, fooling around with Satchmo. Now you has jazz, 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 then swanning around with Grace Kelly. I give to you and you give to me true love. Right, stop. Okay, enough. Now, the, <laughs> the point about the minstrel is that um, how do you reverse racial minstrelism? Um, I basically feel that black women, led by Oprah and Condoleezza Rice, um, have pioneered the way. Oprah had Dr. Phil, but I just realized with horror today, looking over this book, Oprah gave us um, Mehmet Oz, did she not? <laughs> yes. Condi, Condoleezza Rice, had George Bush. I have Bing Crosby. <laughs> Rules for minstrels. Um, they must do something in public you want and aren't allowed to do. Dr. Phil, for instance, he never smiles or make warm little jokes. He never worried about his hair. He never handed out presents. He snapped out advice in his Texas twang and let those supplicants know sympathy would cease if they didn't shape up. George Bush didn't have to be stringently self-possessed. He didn't have to be grammatically correct. He didn't have to demonstrate every day and every way that he was truly outstanding and truly deserved the rewards routinely given him. Minstrel men must have some performative essence, gestural, verbal, behavioral, that you, spectator, imitator, and opposite, hold in contempt even as you crave its license. The minstrel's behavior attracts and repels you. Such willfulness, such shamelessness, such presumption. You long for that performative license, but you've been taught it's unworthy, inappropriate. You have higher standards and better values. You're sure of that, but if, however briefly, you could act like that, get away with it. Be rewarded for it. Uh, you can see that this book is uh, at play in the field of words, as, as well as ev everything else. Um, there follows a parade of uh, male alter egos who are also black men. Um, it's true. Bing, Bing was my white minstrel, but we go from Matt, Nat King Cole to Johnny Hartman to Ike, Sly. Ike Turner. Wait, wait, let, let, let's do Sly and Marvin Gaye first. They're a little more <laughs> acceptable. Um, um, and. Then finally, I find my way to um, you know the kind of nightmare alter ego who is Ike Turner. Right, Ike Turner played a big role in the preparation of this book, if I remember <laughs> right. Um, but we're going to leave Ike and Tina behind, um, and we're going to leave um, by uh, just mentioning momentarily the brilliant set piece excavating Willa Cather's writer's psyche. Um, which I think anybody who's a devotee of close reading could use to teach, because it's a close reading of a, some Willa Cather text. Um, and we're going to go to section six, which starts, for a time he and I made a striking couple. And section six, Margot has her hand on her hip, <laughs> um, is about an affair. Um, with a, an Afro-Brazilian lover, and I'm going to ask Margot, is this nameless Afro-Brazilian Afro lover the sort of culmination of your male minstrel uh, alter egos? Well, um, um, 
Well, uh, both um, a, de a quite des a desired love object, which, which, you know, attraction object, which m minstrels don't necessarily have. The attraction doesn't necessarily, please, not with Bing Crosby, run <laughs> through um, a sexual channel. But that was a combination of, um, it certainly ran through that with Ike Turner, of, of Eros, and yes, he, he, had, he had license to behave in ways that I didn't. He swaggered. He swaggered. Um, he commanded, um, not me, but in general the world. And he, he tended to, he set, set the limits um, for wither. The limits and the, um, and the lines, yeah. And in this book, he acts as a hinge. Tell me what you mean. Between <laughs> all the male alter egos of many races, and the excavation of uh, oh. some women who are acting oh as another kind of alter ego. You're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. I, <laughs> I see what I was doing. Yes. Um, see, I did. I made a surprise question. Yes. And <laughs> at the end, as my affair ended, um, and I manufactured two endings, one of them was the kind of um, and I used a little Ma Rainey, and I used a little Virginia Woolf. I had mixed Ma Rainey and Sylvia Plath lines together earlier. But, you know, I was mourning um, with a certain amount of style. The other one I took from um, The Wire. Um, how many of you watched The Wire? A lot of you. All right. Do you remember that scene um, when... <laughs> It's so, it's so vicious. Um, when one young character whose name I'm forgetting is with Snoop, the absolute killer girl assassin. They are in a car together in an alley, and he realizes that she's going she's gonna to kill him, and he pulls a gun on her first. And um, she looks at the gun, and then she turns away and looks in the car mirror and says, how do my hair look? And he says, girl, you look good, and shoots her. Um, in my dream, the two of us shot each other and exited <laughs> from the back doors of a car, nothing but flesh wounds. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. So, but you are right. That then allowed me to say, OK, I, I need some recovery time, dead end here. Um, and the next thing I'm doing is, um, I'm, uh, is reading um, Measure for Measure. And I'm very, very interested in chastity but <laughs> and its we, and strength. Before yeah. we get to virginity and chastity. I thought um, that's where you were taking me. I, I am. <laughs> but I just want to flag another moment of extreme humor, um, which is, um, besides seeking solace from all those things that she just mentioned, including The Wire, um, Margot quotes uh, some Ida Cox blues lyrics. Um, oh, the blues ain't nothing but a slow aching heart disease, just like consumption killing me by degrees. And then she says, yet here I was, undead and alert. <laughs> um, which is Margot's high slapstick deadpan. Um, I wanted to ask, did that, did that come like right out of you? I mean, did it strike you as funny when yes, you wrote absolutely. it? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I also knew, um, I love Ma Rainey, but you know, that's not gonna be a super convincing performance, Margot becoming Ma Rainey. For Ida Cox. Margo, Oh, was that Ida? I, okay, no, it was Ma Rainey I was earlier, sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, I had, I had to play with it, the way we, when you listen to, you know, those great blues singers, you don't pretend you're them, you, you take it in, you, you adapt them. it, you, yeah. yeah. You play with it, you admire it, and you adapt it to your own rhythms. So, yeah. Um, had to do it that way. So one of the pleasures of this book is that a very, very intimate monologue with self is put on the page. I can imagine you hearing this Ida Cox line and thinking, but I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm alert. Let me not even pretend. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, That's okay, right. now we go to... And it's also the uses. Um, I, I'm so interested throughout the book in the various uses for, you know, this line of a song, this movie, that commercial, this lady athlete, um, you know, what, what roles do they play inside you and when and why and when can you put them aside for a while, then go someplace else and then that's gone and you're elsewhere. 
Inside Margot is a cast of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, after the hinge of this the hinge. Uh, love affair that goes wrong, but that Margot ends, we yeah, must Margo pawn ends, off, that's right. point out, <laughs> Margot ends. Um, can you describe the nature of the book that you started to, and I took you back to this moment of humor, after that, it's an excavation of, what do you mean by chastity? Um, what I mean um, is not literally, because I, I started um, using the word virginity. I was reading Measure for Measure, and a friend of mine said, oh, I don't like that play. And I said, well, I like intelligent virgins. Um, and then I realized that what I was thinking about um, was the... This, the self and the soul um, and the body um, of, um, of a woman who is thinking and feeling her way through her life um, and needs that space. Of, microphone, microphone. Oh, and she is, uh, this woman, could you hear me until that moment? And needs that solitary space um, where no, no demands, um, super physical, um, emotional, in terms of the role you're playing, um, those are all held at bay, and you are um, in a state. Of, you're in. Remember that old phrase? You're in a brown study. <laughs> remember that, where you're you're thinking, you're alone, you're um, contemplating the self, the soul, and the world um, without interference, and you're self-sufficient, um, which is something women um, so seldom are um, or find ways to be. So yes, I was, I was restoring um, this, this self um, by thinking about um, through writers like Harriet Jacobs and Marianne Moore, the various ways um, that one kind of reclaims that, that solitude of self uh, that I call a kind of um, emotional and spiritual chastity. Yeah, um, you say in the book, the body at peace, alone with itself at last. And I think um, another of the pleasures of this book is it's full of quotes from other people, but you, the reader, can take quotes from Margot into your book of quotes. Um, the quotes are always, um, they're, various, they're various font plays and script size plays, the, uh, plays throughout the book. The quotes are always um, bold-faced and there are in notes. I change them sometimes, I deliberately misread them, I put certain words under erasure, but they are always recognizable as quotes and I do, um, at the very end, you know, name the writers um, because I would be so lonely without um, you know, my writing world being peopled by all these writers. I've you know, extracted words from and kept on note cards over the years, or, yeah. It, do, yeah, I, it, is, it is partly to assuage the loneliness of writing um, and, and of, and of <laughs> the, solid, the solitude of your own prose. No, I remember whenever you've had a writer's block or a momentary hesitation when writing a piece to deadline, you would always start with a quote. Yes, exactly. And it's <laughs> a testament to the amazingly cultural echo chamber of your nuclear family, I think. Ah, I think you're right. Because there was all kinds of uh, Victorian poetry, Shakespeare, Langston Hughes, Negro yes. spirituals, everything was yes. coursing through that I, household. Even Ida Cox. Even <laughs> Ida Cox, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, so um, I want to come out uh, at what I think is a great retelling of the Josephine Baker story near the end. Um, could you say when and how you realized that you wanted to tell this story and where you wanted to put it? In other words, what you wanted the progression of the book to get from Josephine Baker? Ah, the original version of that uh, was written maybe five years ago hmm. for a conference held at Barnard um, on Josephine Baker. Oh, and I had forgotten that. That's right. That's when I really started taking her in, um, you know, in, as, as, as a, you know, 20s adorable, naughty, new Negro and new woman, um, as a diva, as a, you know, chanteuse, um, as a bad girl um, who always managed to triumph. Um, no, 
no bad endings there for her uh, misbehaviors as a fashion plate. Um, uh, the part that I had the least interest in, I have to admit, but I, you, find a, you try to find a way. Um, all the, the adopting of the children, because so many of them, as it turned out, one found out from her son, um, Jean-Claude Baker, some of them were stolen from their parents. <laughs> it, was, it was a kind of act of mastery that called itself an act of selfishness. Josephine Baker, after her amazingly decades-long career on the stage, or during, D yeah, even during, adopted what she called a rainbow tribe and of like children. like 16, something like yeah, that. Yeah, and I've put them all that. in a castle in the middle of France. And then went off touring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again. Uh, but also she had fought um, for the French, for the free French. She'd been a spy during the war. Um, and she had been a civil rights activist. Um, I don't know, very challenging um, when she came to the United States. So, uh, as she was... In, in, shamelessly bold and resourceful, which is a personality, a type of a personality that is very different from mine and that absolutely fascinates me. Um, so so you, you, re, you come out of the Baker story, which is just wonderfully and told. It's towards the it's towards the end, yeah. yes. And it, and it has the right weight of getting towards the end. And you say, I get tired of thinking of women like Baker as traditional divas. The greats we call divas, women like Baker, Ethel Waters, Bessie Smith, like Isadora Duncan and Martha Graham, are as much combatants and liberators as they are divas. Yes, and that does, but you know, there is that legacy so much, um, particular, well, I shouldn't say particularly, but so intensely emphasized in um, black feminist history, that legacy of warriors, combatants, um, and I wanted to vary it. I wanted to blend it with this legacy of this playful hoyden, this glamour girl, this you know collector of um, languages, of gentlemen callers, um, this witch. She wrote, I think, four or five um, autobiographies. Uh, so I wanted to the, her variableness. Is that a word, variableness? Uh, it is now. It is now, okay. Um, that was what seemed to me she, to, to be so fascinating. Um, all of these various persona and personalities and styles and ways of being and writing and making music in some way or another. Not that she did them all better than anyone else, but when you put it all together, she did more of them than almost anyone else. And so that, that that polyphony and that variability and those contradictions that a single character, a single person could continue to hold and you know, use and play with and do little metamorphoses with, uh, that was fascinating to me. She evaded the tragic diva. She, yes, and she evaded, yes, absolutely. The tragic diva, the tragic, you know, woman, who woman of two cultures, woman of multi races. She evaded all. She of was that. a trickster and a shapeshifter. Yes, yes, exactly. While being becoming ever more herself. Exactly. But then we get to um, the idea in this same section that women like Josephine Baker are not really, not exactly alter egos of the narrator either, because the narrator. The Margot narrator confesses that she's not like that. Um, that you marvel at people like that. That utter strength of, of will, of self-invention, of I don't really care what you think, I'm going to do it. Um, what, what? I don't really care what you think, I'm going to do it. Um, and I take pleasure in the difficulties of fearlessness. Yeah, Ella Fitzgerald's story is another one of the book. And there's the book. even a moment when um, my sister and I um, are looking at Gone with the Wind, um, and we're not engaged deeply. We have many mixed feelings about Hattie McDaniel, but her strength and a certain intelligence, in fact, is recognizable to us, and, 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 I, and it's very striking. And the line um, that I write is, Denise and I were afraid of so many things. They the, weren't, what, what? Denise and I were afraid of so many things. You know, right. they weren't epic, they weren't war, but um, there was a, sort of, a certain timidity that, that I, I think our background, um, 
courteous, genteel um, <laughs> um, timidity, um, somewhat encouraged um, to have to be expected to have perfect behavior, perfect grades, um, you know, to succeed um, you know, dis against the odds, but never actually um, making people furious with you. Uh, there is a certain um, artful timidity to yeah, that, uh, per, um, which per, I took fully in. Per, pursuit of perfection breeds fear. Yes, it about does. Not, not about reading, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not and make, getting and there. And can make your definition of perfection get ever smaller and smaller. And it, it, even if Josephine and Ella Fitzgerald act as sort of flags, personal flags of the narrator in the book, triumphant flags, we get at the end of the Josephine Baker section, we get um, a sort of a tragic tale of an anti-Josephine, which is uh, a friend of Irma Actually, Jefferson's. Actually a friend of my mother's who had very promising career. Um, she was offered, she was an actress, um, she was uh, offered a Hollywood contract. She was told that she could have the contract if she would agree to pass for white. She was not recognizably as people saw it in those days. Um, a Negro, she was um, progressive, she was a leftist, she, and she just refused to do it. She went back to Chicago and started a W.E.B. Du Bois theater group and wrote for radio shows. Um, and the life eventually fell apart. She had nervous breakdown. She was institutionalized for some years. Um, she encounters my mother and a group of my mother's friends um, at lunch. Um, I won't go into great detail, but she is the, she is the side, the, the flip, the, the underworld um, in a sense, meaning shadowed and you know, not lit by success um, of a Josephine Baker, um, a very talented um, woman of color, um, whose color um, and whose talents um, um, American history could really, um, and society could not find a place for. And she broke um, under that strain. And, uh, and her story is like the shading, the shadow. Yes. It's an, and it's a reminder of the reader um, of the fragility of some of the pieces of self that are being assembled. And, oh, yes, and of the um, fragility of luck in terms of history. You know, I, young actresses, actresses of my generation, not even actresses in their 20s and 30s, um, they had options that were simply not there for Josephine Baker. Women of our generation had, for Josephine Baker, I mean for Janice Kingslow, women of our generation have choices, chances, um, imaginative possibilities that history simply denied um, yeah. their predecessors. And you know, I'm, I'm so aware of that. It's, it's luck of the draw. Yeah, that's another kind of fragility, yeah. the fragility of history. In a minute, I'm gonna open the floor to questions. Um, I wanna just, um, talk a, for a minute about the end of the book in which you return to the personal, so it comes full circle. Um, so it's the personal in the shape of my grandmother, um, who has appeared nowhere um, else in the book. Yeah, but uh, it's a, bit, a little bit about the trope of the black grandmother who is always so tired, so tired. And, but, but also standing for um, and exhorting you to embrace a kind of endurance and again, perfection of hard work and struggle. Um, so you're always trying to live up to this figure of triumph and suffering, um, which my grandmother managed to reject while nevertheless triumphing um, and seeming um, altogether, um, you know, as forbidding as any goddess. And talking of history, could we read the last, the very last line? Could you find it? Sure. Um, because it, it it's, has a kind of poetic ending that you know is exactly right, but it's hard to say why. <laughs> if it's but, hard for you, you know it's hard for it's me. it's mysteriously right. Yes, all right. Um, uh, do you mean that last paragraph? All right. Um, it yeah. The the piece was set in motion by my being at a at a feminist black feminist kind of conference where um, we were talking about you know uh, wages for housework and um, better wages for 
women who do other people's housework. And one woman there, black, said, you know, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm tired for what my grandmother did. And something about that at the time sent me into an absolute rage and fury. And I think um, this last ending kind of addresses that. Um, uh, in the privacy of, oh, you say you're tired for what your grandmother did. You should be tired, because after all her hard work, if your grandmother were alive, she'd probably ask if you'd earned your right to be tired yet. That was snippy me many years ago. In the privacy of my own psyche, I was not willing to give space to the figure of the generically tired black grandmother. Mine had worked unceasingly to will herself out of that role, and she had an early death to show for it. If she were alive here now with me, what would she say? I think she'd say quietly and not without tenderness. You haven't earned your right to be tired yet, have you, donkey? Blackout. It's unbelievably sad and completely mysteriously provocative. And that, she did call me donkey. Yeah. Yeah, which I wish my grandmother had called me donkey, but she didn't have that kind of imagination. <laughs> um, okay, there are two microphones, one on either side of the house. Um, we can take some questions for about 10 minutes. So anybody with a question is invited to proceed to a microphone. And if not, Elizabeth, I'm sure, has a few more. <laughs> Nobody has a question. No, there is so. a question. Oh, good. Brave and bold. I'm so nervous. Um, OK, what is my question? Hi. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking when I was reading this book about um, this idea in psychoanalysis that in the absence of parents, um, real parents or symbolic parent figures, um, the superego becomes really harsh um, and really punishing. Um, and I was so it's kind of reminding me of what you said earlier about being really severe with yourself. And so, I don't know, do you, did, did this feel at all like kind of reckoning with that punishing superego and sort of in a therapeutic that's, way? That's, that's interesting. Um, yes, it did because I allowed myself um, other, other pleasures, other encounters. Um, so I think that's absolutely right. You know, part of the part of the, of the story of the book, I stopped myself from saying journey, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, is um, f discovering um, what um, I needed to continue to take with me um, from my parents and from that whole world that they um, joined and embodied and created and, and what I had already left behind and what I needed to really um, reckon with still needing to leave behind, and and what you say about the um, the sort of almost automatic um, punitive um, <laughs> intense intensities um, and intense of the superego. Yeah, I, I think I modulated it and put it to other purpose to other ends. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yeah. Um, if the audience is silent on the subject of questions. Um, I want to flag just one more quote. <laughs> I knew you uh, would. Um, because um, this is an, in Margot's conversation with Josephine Baker. She says, we know, we declare vehemently that race is a construction. Um, and this is, this is highlighting the fact that you can hear the dynamics of a voice in this book. And the next sentence is, we also know that race is a construction site we're not going to be leaving anytime soon. <laughs> I've forgotten that, yeah. It's like, you know, the, it's like the writer listening to what she just wrote, and a, a, a one-liner comes right after it. Um, I'm always trying to tell my students, I know you are too, Margot taught today, she's kind of heroic to be up here. No, <laughs> kind of happy to be at being attended to <laughs> rather than attending to them, yes. Um, I'm saying that you should surprise yourself when you're writing because otherwise it's dead. And I think this book is full of times when Margot surprises herself in a line or a one-liner or yeah, yeah. a little observation. Um, and it's often funny, but it's also... Uh, 
you know, a riff from a formal, a, a, like a social cliche into a half skeptical, half um, let's go on with the thought, aperçu. Okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Uh, you know, we do all, we all work with, we all use um, cliches. There's no point in pretending we don't. Um, and, you know, we live by declarations and pronouncements. I remember, you know, for several years we were all beside ourselves with race as a construction. It was very exciting. Um, and, and in some ways it still is, but, you know, then life starts accruing <laughs> around it and the contradictions and the... Um, you know, the, yeah. so then your language has to, in some way, um, because take the statement that in. goes blank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Krithika is standing at a microphone. Um, I have one question from the virtual audience, um, which was, can you tell us about the editing process for your book, moving as it does, not chronologically, through a great deal of material? Wait, the ending the editing editing process. process. I know. Quite ending process. Edi editing. Editing. Ending, but Ed I'm, edits. Oh, editing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of, thank you. Editing, a lot of editing is, um, I would call it, rewriting and rearranging. Um, the, the structure um, was, was the devil. Um, you know, I, I, I would start thinking that, um, you know, Bud Powell and Ella Fitzgerald are going to lead me here. Um, and then I would, as I kept writing, I would realize, no, um, they're not leading me there. <laughs> they're, uh, no, um, I, they're leading me somewhere else. Something else needs to go where. A lot of it was um, a kind of structural and psychological, you cut and paste, you recut and you repaste. You rethink, you, you put it in that, put it all together in that version, and then you give yourself some time um, uh, some reading, some music that gives you some alternatives of ways to do things, um, and then you put it together again. So I, I really just kept arranging and rearranging and thinking of what what transitions mattered, how they would what how they would work, and how like the construction site they might feel fresh. Some of them I think are too obscure. I don't. Some of them I think don't don't fully work, but just one of them is too abrupt, but we're not going to go there <laughs> we're not because going there now. We're we have not a question, a questioner a... at a microphone. Good. Anne, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I just wondered, I just read this new, I think it's a new book about Josephine Baker and her time in the resistance. Yes. And it was really stunning. I mean, my impression before had been that she was sort of a helper, and some people stayed at her castle and so forth. But this was absolutely incredible. She was on the road as well, <laughs> an undercover. I mean, yes, yeah, bye. She was, she was doing many, many extremely dangerous things. And I wondered if that uh, might have changed your view of her somewhat. You know, I had not read that book, but I had read um, a number of books about her. And I had, again, I think, you know, particularly um, Jean-Claude Baker, but others. Um, you know, I, I, I knew um, that she had done that and utterly unexpected. Um, you know, it's been emerging over the years and now it's um, hit, you know, it's been collected in this book. Um, I think the way that, um, I think it very much um, dictated the way I ended the piece because I said the, the last glimpse I give readers of her is, of her in her uniform of the Free French Army at the March on Washington. Um, she's got the whole uniform on. She's also got those great black diva sunglasses on, you know. So, and she is the only woman allowed to speak. Um, and she's also the only decorated military hero there. Um, yeah, it's great, and that you brought up yeah. that book. It it does change. Um, um, I think we are, have come to a close. Oh, wait, we have one more question. This is the last question. I'll, I'll make it brief. I came in a little late. You might have already addressed this, but I'm interested in knowing who were the writers that really had the most influence on you. And I, I was a big fan of yours, still am a big fan of yours, but I used to avidly read you in The Times. And I'd like to ask you to compare writing journalism, and you did so many things at The Times, and you won a Pulitzer and all those accolades, but how do you compare that kind of writing, that kind of work, 
with doing a book? I mean, are there similarities or is it com two completely different uh, th things? There are certainly similarities because, you know, in my case, I basically got, you know, the craft. I learned it as a critic um, at Newsweek, at the New York Times, writing for various other places. That's where I assembled, you know, my, my, um, my, ba my bag of, 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 I shouldn't say tricks and manners, but of, of craft elements. And how do, how do, it's how I began to shape myself as, um, as a critic. The difference I would basically say is, um, in theory, if you are writing a book, um, yes, I know there are editors, you know, there are constraints, but you are, you are alone with it and yourself. Um, every magazine you work for um, has certain constraints, restraints, um, just rules, r ranging from how long the piece is to um, a certain style, a certain style of prose that even though, you know, you could separately identify this contributor or that, um, there is a, a kind of collective voice um, of the whole. I think if you read the Times, if you read almost in the New Yorker, you'll, you'll see that. And all of us in some way um, adapt to that. Uh, and also, you know, there are certain conformities, again, having to do with, with an honorable house style um, of structure. Um, you know, if you're writing journalism, you might be told, now stop beginning things with that kind of question. Um, maybe your book editor will tell you that too, but you can play with it much, much, much longer um, and, and take more liberties. Could you talk about the influences on you, the, pri the primary God, paramount? God, every influence? writer that, I don't know who the primary, who my well, primary not, not influences one, are. Um, I've read, you know, I, I often cite um, Ralph Ellison and Virginia Woolf, um, but um, <laughs> because of, of his, I'm thinking of his criticism, and I'm thinking of her criticism, but also, um, to some extent, both of their fictions, um, they matter. Um, Golly, um, who else do I admire? There are so many people. You know, I used to, when I was writing for the Times, if, if I felt I needed a certain kind of, of tone or a certain kind of courage or a certain kind of subtlety, I would think about writers that I admired. And there were so many. You know, if I wanted to be clever and very strong-willed, I'd pick up a bunch of Shaw. Um, oh, really? You know, I'd pick up George some Bernard. of the reviews. I'd pick up some of the plays. If I wanted to be... Um, Subtler and questioning, uh, maybe I'd pick up um, Chekhov. You know, there, there's always, yeah. So in that way, it's, it's, it's like they're, they're all in some huge stew for me. I don't have one single famous, uh, f sorry, famous, famous writer whom I admire above all. When you get to a certain age, you have read a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> that is one, maybe the only advantage. <laughs> um, Oh, thank, oh, thank you, you for saying that. Thank How you. wonderful that you said that. <laughs> we love you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Before, thank you so much. Before everybody goes, um, I want to thank Kai Bird and the Leon Levy Center. I want to thank Shelby White, the angel of the world of biography, um, and Leon Levy, the benign ghost of the world of biography. And I want to thank the Graduate Center's public programs for co-sponsoring this event. And I want to thank you all for coming yes. and being a lovely, lovely audience um, full of a surprising number of friends and relatives. <laughs> OK, um, yes. audience, good thank night. You. Thank you, thank you. Oh, books. Oh, signing books. Margot will sign books out there. If you want to buy them, they are for sale. Want me to or not, I will sign. And you can put them in a pocket. It's a small book. <laughs>